So um, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to speak with everyone today. So I'm here from the Translational Genomics Research Institute, which is kind of one of these unintended spin-outs of NHGRI. Jeffrey Trent left NHGRI about 2002, and um, that's when um, they started designing the building and bringing together scientists focused on, uh, on the concept, which brings us here today. So um, in, in essence, it's the goal of the institute, the goal of um, the research. And I'm going to describe um, some of the work that we're doing and really represent a few other people here. Um, Dan Von Hoff, who's our physician in chief and leads us on the clinical side. Myself and John Carpton lead the, the sequencing and informatics, where the latter is more of my focus. So um, I'm going to talk mostly about the um, kind of applied clinical genomics center um, uh, that, that we're working on and have been for some time. And um, it's going to follow up on some of the comments that Eric made with um, a focus on misspelled their oncology. And really, it's focused in on kind of a premise of a question and a research question of Dan von Hoff's is molecular profiling using these genomic technologies um, to increase availability of options for treating cancer patients. Do those, um, do those perform better than standard of care? Um, and the overall approach that we're using over the past two years is integrative analysis of whole transcriptome and whole genome sequence for treatment when no other clear options are um, available. And, and like the St. Jude talk yesterday, all of the, the, the sequencing and, and these projects are done in the context of um, clinical research protocols. And so this is something that's building on earlier work, and, and we, I put down there at the bottom this JCO article looking at molecular profiling through um, expression affiarrays and uh, um, their effectiveness versus um, kind of a standard of care using um, time to progression, among other metrics, to evaluate their effectiveness. But this is one of the things that, that you know, as I see as collaborative opportunities, I'm going to hit that. I am seeing a, a, a large number of genomes that aren't funded by NHGRI appear when individuals have late-stage metastatic disease and there isn't a clear options and they're going to complete genomes, they're going to Illumina, they're going to various sequencing centers, um, having their tumor sequenced, a lot of times they're having the germline sequenced, sometimes the RNA is sequenced, and they're identifying targets through analysis, they're being placed on um, medicine after clear validation of any of those targets. And many times there is um, an outcome measure that would be a time to progression, uh, um, 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 a survival. And what you're seeing here is, is this, this is occurring at a number of sites. And um, it, it's kind of this um, anecdotal network of individuals who, who try to work together and, and share common experiences. The, the science article yesterday was a, our sci uh, the science translational medicine article is a, a good example of that. Um, and so it, it is one of those opportunities to get together unique resources speaking towards having a data sets, and the problem is just getting them together, but they actually have outcome as well when they're placed on a treatment. And, and that's unique, and, and they, they, a, lot of, a lot of cases they aren't funded by NHGRI. So um, we um, have a number of studies underway, and so um, we've probably gone through about 50 patients in the past year, and I'll walk through that process through a variety of studies. There's a, there's a series of, st of um, studies that are forthcoming but yet to be announced, and, uh, and this is one of going to be kind of our core premises going forward. So I'm going to walk through this path, and this is probably one of the more relevant uh, um, slides, and I'll leave the rest to examples which kind of shows how we're doing this, working with our clinical partners. And so there'll, there'll be a study with um, entry criteria, and there's a surgical resection, and this is one of the parts where there's involvement all along. And, and like, like Eric said, um, you know, having f um, frozen tumor is one of those things, and having the right type and the right amount of materials is important. But at a first support layer for this, that goes to a CLIA lab. and. Um, Currently, we, we used Keras Gene Deox, but, but we're also building one um, with a new recruitment to TGen. And essentially, that's where the clinical path occurs, and the sample is effectively kind of split along two paths, and with one path remaining at the CLIA center, and then it going down to a second support layer, which is a sequencing of a whole genome and RNA. And that's one of the things we're looking at um, oncology and some of the objectives 
of the research protocols we're doing, there are a lot of pharmaceutical developments that occur in the context of overexpression, right? And so not always is a marker going to be DNA-based. It may be DNA, RNA, and protein. They're all markers there along the same vein. I'll show examples of that, but, but, but the RNA helps support and steam along the analysis. Um, uh, uh, there is quite a bit of work, and it's a lot of time I spent on kind of integrative analysis of all these data sets. And, um, and, and this feeds into informatics. And for us, we have historical databases that we have and that we've worked with others to develop that help in this kind of um, feeding into a board meeting uh, of experts, which then feed to back to the first layer of support, which goes into the question, really, what are you going to um, validate in a CLIA setting and um, to eventually go to the partners and kind of working on the treatment decision and then what's very important with this is get to an outcome because these are research studies and that's an important aspect, but they also inform us and they're something that can be helpful in, in, in future uses in a way to kind of bring these all together. So, uh, so in essence, the, the, there are several layers of support here and you know a, a lot of the time does get spent um, actually on the connection points, which is what we want to eliminate because these are individuals who will often have um, recurrent metastatic disease, they've failed uh, or um, uh, uh, various treatments, they're probably on a treatment, and this is all occurring, anticipating that there may be need for a second therapy option or a third therapy option. And so in essence, we're trying to get all this done within a six to 10 week, 12 week timeline, uh, because that, that's a point where you know, it, obviously, if the current treatment fails and it was in a research setting, then there, the next one, it's going to be a bigger question. So if you sequence the genome, um, what targets can you identify and what can you do in these cases? Um, so that's kind of the end goal then um, uh, of the first two layers, which, you know, really to identify those events. And these are just a series of tumors that we kind of graphically represent as, um, a, as uh, as these circles diagrams, but there's a, you know, a couple of key messages. When you're looking at germline events, I've spent a lot of time looking at them. A lot of times we're asking questions about a single event, and there was a lot of discussion yesterday about black or white, right? And so what we see in a lot of the tumor genomes is that the variant specific to the tumor has a very high risk uh, of being predicted prognostically or maybe even towards treatment. And they're quite frequent, a KRAS mutation, a BRAF mutation. These are things which are already in clinical settings. They, they do have a lot, but, but here's a key. They, they will occur often together. We're seeing emergence of these panels, you know, like 46 genes, 60 genes, 70 genes, and you will not just always get one thing, and the choice be obvious in that case, because what, I, what we do see when we interact on the, the, the clinical side is somebody will ask a question, well, I have a PIK3CA mutation, I have also a KRAS mutation, right? So the question we were talking about in the breakout session is in a way these are gene-gene interactions that, that do reach the, the, you know, fairly far downstream into the clinical setting, and they're questions that are hard to answer without additional research. And so, it, you know, the idea here that it's just one, and it'll be black or white, it'll likely require integrative analysis, and at the end of the day, you start to wonder whether or not there are, you know, um, needs for experts who become like radiologists or something that interpret series of events together, right, and understand the molecular biology. Those are things we, we talk about as down the road. So what I'll do here um, is just walk through a couple of examples, because I think the examples help bring the point. Um, and, and I think there's about 50 or so of these, and, and, and these are selected just to highlight some of the challenges and issues. So first one is going to be a metastatic uterine transitional cell carcinoma. Um, this is part of a... Um, um, NFCR, National Foundation Cancer Research Project, which um, Glenn Weiss is uh, the physician lead on this one. And um, this has been sequenced on an Illumina high seq and uh, normal um, tumor. We also did RNA seq. And so when you're looking at things like panels and what would appear on panels, you could select out various things. But, but had we done just a panel on this, we would get a TP53 mutation, not surprisingly. Now, when we go back and take a bigger look at all the richness of data that comes with whole genome sequencing, we can start to look at different levels. And in this graph, I'm showing a lot of copy number amplifications and deletions 
ascertained through the sequence. And so you start to see more of these come up that, that you would recognize EGFR um, is amplified. And, and that's something that has um, uh, um, to some in a research setting clinical utility. There's MYC, which, which confounds certain things. There's PIK3CA as an amplification. But we also have um, TP53 mutation. And so it's considering these in the context together because there's a lot of research data out there speaking towards these all being important. And it, it brings into the question of that decision-making process. And so if we, we back away from this and we say, let's take a look at some of these major events, and EGFR FR amplification ha has a lot of meaning towards predicting a, a, you know, a targeted therapy, TP53 is relevant. And so it's what comes along with this. But one of the things that, that we don't mention is, is a lot of the physicians we're working with are starting to make and think about what's not there. And so in this case, you know, there, this is one that I find difficult to, to answer a lot on the informatics side. There isn't evidence for a KRAS mutation. And there are papers, you know, discussing the relevance or non-relevance. And when we look at what comes out of somatic genomes, they usually don't tell you what's not there, right? And, and a lot of times we don't because we don't always write, really have the right frameworks for describing that. But there are decisions being, you know, considered in the context of that. And so in this case, um, a lot of the, the work that went on this was based on previous literature where you do have re pre research on tumors um, of this type that are maybe negative for P16. So there was a P16 deletion. Um, there's P53, um, um, EGFR. And so this is one of those events that actually becomes more on the straightforward side, right? And so um, EGFR overexpression and application was actually CLIA validated because um, that's, uh, that, that, that was one of the things that, that was believed to be um, the most helpful for the, the physician team and then the patient um, went on cetexomib and based on that application and um, the absence of KRAS mutation. But the messages from this one are, you know, you do find these events which are a combination of a lot of different things together. And I do start to think that with these targets, uh, target sequencing, you're going to start to see combination events occur. and people making decisions on combination of events. And so, you know, the question is, is, you know, um, um, how, how do we kind of put together this information? And even just starting with the somatic ge genome sharing or itself or, or the interpretive events, so those aren't necessarily even descriptive, but, you know, what, what's the outcome uh, of, of these patients? And so that's the second example I will give and, um, and then wrap this up. So this is a collaboration with Life Technologies um, funded by the, the, um, their foundation, U.S. Oncology, TGen and Keras Diagnostics, and basically focusing on triple negative breast cancer, um, chemo-resistant metastatic disease. And so, you know, I'm going to show some of these graphs, and they are sequenced database, but this is a, a normal tumor pair. What we see is deletion of um, P10, which um, in a research setting um, th uh, helps um, um, uh, inform about later downstream pathways. Now, when I mention there's clear validation, we don't really always, or even that often, focus on validating what we see exactly from the next gen. A lot of times we're, we're validating downstream. Um, for a P10 deletion, we're, we may look at the expression, but at the end of the day, you know, the, this one was actually going to have some clear validated results at downstream at the protein level. And so one of the reasons we're, we're needing to look at CLIA for informing some of this is that, 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 that it's not just for us going to be, you know, a sequence-based assay because it does speak to broader context. So in a combination of single risk factors, that's another thing, but you have these concepts. It's so, you know, also one of these patients which had the P10 under expression, we observed um, a BRAF, um, uh, what looked initially like an application, but with the next-gen sequencing, we were able to reconstruct it and to double minute and see that it was amplified several fold, I don't know the exact fold, and so you see also some um, fish on this. And so this individual here has a P10 deletion, they have a BRAF amplification, and these speak towards broader concepts which um, are really relevant in the development of some drugs, and it, it, you know, the, the, there are directions you might go with each. And so one of the things that comes out of these is a question of combinations. And so combinations are something that are often in the realm of phase one trials, and this particular patient, 
um, uh, was enrolled in um, uh, the, the START Center um, uh, clinical trial looking at PI3K, AKT, mTOR, um, and RASMIC or, uh, pathways. And uh, in essence, it's two therapies, right? Because there are multiple events going on. And this is a patient that, that you know, the, 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 re the, the clear results suggest might benefit uh, by in this study. These are actually some of the um, 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 scans of the individual, and one of the things that was notable is the 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 the, the start trial was you know observed a notable, very remarkable as they described it regression um, based on that combination. One of the the more notable ones of all the ones that they did, and it had an impact in, in a number of ways, including you know additional trials looking at this because this was the only triple negative breast cancer patient that was um, described and done within the context of this, and this is presented at ASCO um, earlier. So um, just some messages. Um, whole genome sequencing and cancer is being done. I, I think I, I'm hearing it more often in the context of treatment within open clinical protocols. I think that the yesterday there was indication of that. It, it, you're seeing it often. When you contact Illumina's CLIA labs, I think they told me that 40% of the time it's going to be cancer for them. The completes told me the same. And then you get these hard drives moving around. And, and then you get these decisions being made in research settings, and there are outcomes. And so I think a major question is how do you put this together? Because this is really new territory. It, it's, it's something that, that does belong in research but does have broader scale impact later downstream. Um, and so the, there are a few ways to, to facilitate that. And so um, those are kind of the, the, the key messages. And um, there's a lot of people here. I kind of highlighted them throughout. And there's a lot of different sources. And so I couldn't fit them all in one slide. So I, I risk offending everyone over anyone specific. But thank you. All right, thanks very much. We have time for a couple of questions, if there are any. So uh, thank you. Uh, there's certainly a lot of enthusiasm in the oncology community for um, uh, diagnostic tools to help make decisions. And many people are doing it, but I'm not aware of any rigorous studies that have actually tried to demonstrate that the decisions that are being made are the correct ones. Are you aware of any such studies? And what are TGEN's plans for demonstrating that these technologies are actually uh, useful as opposed to just anecdotal. So um, the the mo the one that we point to for um, on the rigorous side would be the JCO paper with Dan von Hoff, and where that became the the premise for Target Now. Now the big thing that the editorial that accompanied that pointed out correctly is this isn't a randomized trial, and so. Dan has said one thing before he will retire that he has to do, and to make this credible and to really go forward is there is a need for um, a randomized trial going forward, and I would say that, that, that it is probably the most important thing we can do is to really do that in a proper way, and I would say going forward, that is needed to get away from this anecdotal part because when you show anecdotal results, and I, I don't like to, they give you a, a, a wrong impression sometimes, well, a lot of the time. So I think that um, these are research protocols, um, but more importantly, there is a need for some sort of randomized trial on this. And I think there, that's, that's the big thing that I believe going forward will be the, the, the initiative and the funding is being brought together for that in a larger scale. Yeah, you, you correctly point out that the editorial was actually fairly critical, and it was written mm -hmm. by Jim Dorshow, Deputy Director of the National Cancer Institute, and yet uh, company Keras has been formed and is actually selling this technology on the basis of this one non-randomized pilot study that's been criticized. And I think it's just important as TGen moves forward in this direction that the studies really be rigorous so we can understand the utility of these of these diagnostics. Yeah, and, and I think that that 
the, that critique um, really has sat home with, with Dan because whenever he presents the paper, and I didn't do it, he also presents the editorial side by side and the, the impact um, that that has it. So the, the need for the rigorous trial and Karis, you know, and what happened after that um, ha it definitely serves as important lessons going forward. Um, but but I, I guess the, the, uh, to emphasize that the fear is, is this is coming, so there is a high importance to putting that on. And I would say that that's, that's the thing that we do talk about the most is, is putting this together in the rigorous of really randomized trial and um, not having it in a way where variables or questions can change, right? So I know that you have chosen not to do the sequencing in a in a clinical lab, but to, to use clear confirmation of variants. I'm just wondering, from a practical point of view, obviously you've got to confirm all of the negative findings, all of the lack of amplification, all of the lack of mut mutations, if you're using this for a clinical decision. So do you end up using a, like a 49 gene panel or something to confirm your negative results, or how do you clinically confirm the negative results on the sequencing? And how does that compare cost-wise with just doing the initial sequencing in the clinic? So that's a really good question. So first thing I'll say is, is it's nearly, in my mind, and I'm an informatician on the statistical side, I don't think it's possible to prove a negative. But, um, and so, uh, you know, obviously people do act upon that, but that's something they, that, that is kind of hard to do. Um, I have this other belief, which is the most interesting thing from whole genome sequencing has the highest error rate. And we see that from, from things like thousand genomes, loss of function, there's a lot of logic to why that is. And so the idea of how you interpret something when you have four million variants and millions of hypotheses asked, I, we do actually do much of our sequencing in the Illumina Clio lab, but we still validate it additionally because you know, if you said, where are the loss of function variants in that Illumina analysis, you're going to find a higher error rate of false positives than would you grab a random snip out of anywhere. So the mentality for the, that I have is, is that it, it, it is helpful, but even when we run our, we, we ship it to Illumina, it's done in a CLIA lab, we don't interpret the variants in the way. And so for us, um, now in terms of could we just run another panel? We find a lot of events um, in our cases are actually things that might be missed by various panels. An amplication might be missed by a 46 gene panel, which goes to PCR to exhaustion that's only really validated on mutations and indels, right? Uh, translocations do not appear effectively in most panels. So um, in, in that context, the panel is helpful for validation, but you don't know which panel. Different panels will tell you different things, and sometimes you do need to go further downstream. I do have a lot of nervousness about um, going forward with results, even you know when they look clear as day, there may be something surprising. So additional CLIA validation is something that we're really thinking of. And for us, um, there will be the, the exomes figured out and how you interpret variants, and there's a lot of great people doing that. But, but, but we've kind of taken this path, and we'll follow the lead of others for whole genome exome and direct interpretation, because um, that's a little bit beyond just what we can do. So um, I, I agree with you that the whole genome sequencing approach is much better than these limited panels. But in um, the experience that I have, the vast majority of tumors are highly contaminated with normal stroma. And so how, how, what percent of tumors can, do you think can actually be subjected to this type of analysis? So um, a lot of my energy, uh, you know, on, and so forth, we've been thinking about design. So in, internally, we will exome sequence plus some sort of medium pass, um, whole genome sequencing plus RNA-seq so that we try to put depth where depth is needed. We focus on insert sides outside of, you know, for the whole genome side because if we're going to interpret something in the middle of nowhere, it might be a translocation or structural event, and therefore sequence depth isn't important as physical depth, right? So we try to basically design the whole genome assay around addressing that depth problem so that in coding regions, we're 200x re depth. In intronic regions, we might be low sequence depth but high physical coverage depth. So you're using a combination of the whole genome and um, We're using a combination of long, of long insert 
and um, exomes and RNA seq. Um, uh, because I find that that helps us get a little bit lower in the allelic frequency for the somatic variation with those 40%, 50% tumor. And then we, the, the research protocols specify, you know, really specific. Um, we, we take the, the tumors based on whether or not we think we can be successful. So that's where I go back to that surgical resection is, is actually essential, and it does dictate what you can do later. All right, I think we need to move on. Uh, thank you very much. Next speaker is Marin Schooner, who's from the VA.